Let's all stand and welcome Pastor Sammy Rodriguez this afternoon. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Amen. Bless God. If you were here last night, raise your hand. So let just let me ask, are there any thriving people in the house here today? You may be seated for a few minutes. We, we, and, and I know, I, you know there's an accelerated thing. I get that. But this time I'm not kidding because I need to catch my flight <laughs> in just a few minutes. So, I mean, I really have to, we have to land in, in order to land. Um, but there, there's a word that God just placed. First of all, you, I mean, and to Pastor Phil and Pastor Chris, I, I'm committed. I love, your, I love these leaders of C3. And I am the global Hispanic president of the Pringle fan club. <laughs> and, and so I am, I am I'm committed to their vision and their anointing and their assignment. And I know we're about to see greater things around the world. And so I, I am committed. And, and if God permits, and yeah, we'll be here. I'll bring my wife and we'll be here next year. And just, and well, bless God, we'll be here. Yeah. So here's the word. First of all, this faith of ours, our faith is not like any other faith. That's politically incorrect, but it's accurate. Our faith is not like any other faith. Touch your neighbor and tell him, our faith is not like any other faith. Matter of fact, I would, I would say that our faith is transparent, it is transcendent, and it is transformational. Our faith teaches us to cross over obstacles, to shout down walls, to break through crowds and walk on water, even in the midst of storms. Our faith enables us to survive the fires of life, to overcome the den of lions, to silence the serpents and outwit the fox. Our faith empowers us to see the invisible, to embrace the impossible and hope for the incredible. Our faith exhorts us, as we received yesterday, to rebuke failure, to reject perpetual survival, and embrace abundant living. Therefore, permit me to reiterate, in the name of Jesus, and you have free will, you could accept it or reject it, you could receive it or go on Facebook right now. But in the name of Jesus, I will reiterate, I will declare again, that your season of living in failure and failure living in you is over forevermore, never again to be revisited. And your season of perpetual survival is over and your season of thriving for you and your house is alive and well. I believe you're about to leave this conference and you are about to see what you've never seen before. <laughs> Judges 6.24. So let's continue from what happened last night. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, right there. And this is after God, the, the Lord revealed to him and said, listen, you're not going to die, you're going to live. And he named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. If I have to title this, I would title it in the following manner. When life throws you rocks, build an altar. When life throws you rocks, build an altar. Tell your neighbor, when life throws you rocks, build an altar. So let, let's go through this. The drivers build with the shalom of God. After God showed up and told Gideon, all is right, do not be afraid, you will not die, Gideon proceeded in building something powerful, an altar, and he called it shalom. Everybody say shalom. shalom. So he comes along, the, 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 the Lord tells him, look, you're not going to die. He takes him out of the threshing floor. He gives him his identity, who you are, what you have, what you will do in that order. That's critical. And then, and then and you're not going to die. I got this. Now, what does Gideon proceed in doing? He, he builds an altar. And this is powerful because he builds an altar and he calls it shalom. And the word shalom, everybody say shalom. shalom. According to Strong's, shalom means completeness, wholeness, health. Peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony. I like this. The absence of agitation or discord where nothing is missing 
and nothing is broken. Now that, he called it shalom. So all, this is what it means in the Hebrew, shalom, completeness, wholeness, health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, fullness, rest, <laughs> harmony, the absence of agitation or discord, nothing missing and nothing broken. When you know who you are in Christ, when you know what you have in Christ, when you know what you will do with Christ, then you can build and you can construct. And you're going to get this in about a second. He, he understands who he is. The revolution of his true identity, what Pastor Phil would say, the born identity. He discovered who he is in God. And then what he has, you have strength. What will you do? You will defeat the Midianites, the people responsible for taking away your harvest, for enslaving you. And then he subsequently knows that he will not die, that he will see the fulfillment of his promise and his mission. And he builds shalom. That's the word for you today. Not only is the Lord telling you you are a mighty hero and a mighty warrior. Not only is the Lord telling you that you have the strength to overcome. Not only is the Lord telling you in this conference that the enemy of your household and your calling and your harvest will be defeated in the name of Jesus. And not only is the Lord telling you that it's all right, do not be afraid because you will live to see his promises fulfilled in your life. But today, he's telling you, via the conduit of his word and the life of Gideon, that this is your season of shalom. What does that mean, Pastor Samuel? Now I'm going to speak prophetically. Now, this is your season. When I was 14 years old, in, in my Assembly of God church, this, this team challenge director walked in, and again, I was an evangelical agnostic. I did not believe what I saw, and, and I was just tired of the fake stuff. So what, I, I was there seated in my church, and this guy comes in and, and never met him before. He was a team challenge director, a very well-known ministry now globally, but more in the States. It's a drug addiction ministry. Uh, David Wilkerson, actually, was the founder of Teen Challenge. And so I'm, I'm, in, I'm seated, I'm 14 years old, and this man comes in, he's singing a song, and in the middle he stops and he says, I have a word of the Lord. And he says, there's a Samuel, there's a Samuel in this room. And of course, my church being so introverted, all pointed towards me. <laughs> And I'm the only, Sam, and I'm going like, oh man, this is not cool. And, and he begins to lay out, a, I mean, a path, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it included the nuggets, the macro nuggets of, of what I do and the, of me having access to presidents of the United States and leaders around the world. That's crazy. Somebody comes in and says, one day you're going to advise presidents, and you're 14 years old, you're going, yeah, right. Drink the Kool-Aid, buddy. Uh-huh. <laughs> And then the Lord laid out, and then even things like me, Billy Graham and Dr. King, and laid out so many things for my life. And years later, I saw the, I mean, the detailed fulfillment of what God gave me. Because, you know, there is a line between the pathetic and the prophetic. But when someone speaks under the anointing prophetically and releases a word, if you have the audacity by faith of receiving that word, as long as that word lines up with scripture, it will turn your life around forevermore. Now, why do I say all of that? Because the Spirit of God placed in my heart. I say that with fear and trembling, too. Because sometimes we say, God told me, and God says, I never did that. I never told you anything. But, but the Spirit of God did place in my heart to share with you, even in this session, to tell you that this is your season of shalom. What does that mean, Mr. Preacher? Now, this is what God told me to tell you. This is your season of completeness, of wholeness, of health, of peace, of welfare, of safety, of soundness, of tranquility, of prosperity, of fullness, of rest, of harmony, of the absence of agitation and discord. The Lord told me to tell you, this is your season where nothing will be missing and nothing will be broken in your life. I dare you to touch your neighbor and tell him, shalom. Tell your other neighbor, the one of the attitude, tell him shalom. Matter of fact, raise your hand and say, I receive shalom. I receive shalom from my family, shalom from my ministry, shalom from my calling, shalom from my finances, shalom from my health. I dare you to raise both hands and say, I receive shalom. I step into my season where nothing will be broken and nothing will be missing. In the matter of fact, 
by the time I get home, everything will change in my favor in the name of Jesus. And whatever was missing in my house, whatever was broken in my house, by the time I get there, I will see nothing less than the fullness of God's glory and blessings and promises fulfilled in every aspect. I speak shalom. Somebody shout shalom. Shalom. Can we speak shalom over Australia right now? will show up in Australia in such a way that in every family and community the glory of Jesus Christ will be elevated where lives will be filled with God's grace and presence nothing missing, nothing broken Isaiah 26, 3, 4 you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you and all whose thoughts are fixed on you trust in the Lord always for the Lord God is the eternal rock John 15, 11, I have told you this so that your joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, uh, you will abound in every good work. One more time, say shalom. shalom. Say shalom. shalom. Shalom, shalom, shalom. So he builds shalom. He builds shalom. <laughs> you know who you are. Yes, sir. I am a mighty hero. What do you have? I have strength. What will you do? I will defeat the Midianite marauders, those responsible for taking our harvest, for enslaving our people. Wonderful. Build shalom. Will you die? I, I will live to see the fullness, the fulfillment of your word upon me. Great. What do you build? You build shalom. Nothing will be missing. Nothing missing, nothing broken. And then this, that night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar to Baal. What? And cut down the Azra pole standing beside it. First Gideon built an altar and declared shalom. Then God, who witnesses Gideon's building, instructs him to tear down what? His father's altar to Baal. Boop, 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 boop. So it really behooves us to juxtapose both. There's a dichotomy of sorts here. Gideon builds the altar of shalom, the de facto altar of emancipation, yet he builds it in proximity to another altar, the altar of expediency. Because on many occasions in life, we find ourselves between two different altars, two different pieces or motifs that we construct because we're always building something. We're always constructing a paradigm, a schemata. We're always constructing something out of the experiences that life brings forth. We, we either build shalom or we build an altar of expediency. His father had built an altar, but it wasn't shalom. It was the, the counter narrative to shalom. It was an altar of expediency. What is expediency? His father, in order to acquiesce to the enslaving authorities, that captivated God's children, build an altar to appease the circumstance, to placate to the authoritative structure in place. His father sold out, so he built an altar of expediency. He built expediency. And then God, the Lord witnesses, Gideon builds shalom and says, ah, 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 ah. you build, huh? You build shalom. Now go tear what your dad built. Tear that down. Because there are, there's always an opportunity to be expedient, to acquiesce, to surrender, to bow down, to give up truth. We must never sacrifice truth on the altar of expediency. Never. And, and I love this because it was about, it was his dad's, by the way, Gideon's father built, he constructed because he was driven by fear. Gideon constructed the altar because he was driven by faith. Never make decisions based on what your enemies are saying or doing. Gideon's father built the altar of expediency in order to appease and to surrender to what the enemies, the Midianites, the marauders, 
You should never build or construct based on what the devil is telling you, based on what hell is raising up against you. You're not driven by hell. You're driven by heaven. You're not driven by what people say about you. You are driven by God's word upon your life and your destiny and your dream and your future. You're not defined by the giants that rise up against you. You are defined by the stone that brings him down. So he built, he built, he built, he built Shalom, and then he had to bring down what his father constructed. I love this because in our myopic linear sequential worldview, we would tear down and then build. But then God saw him build and gave him the authority to tear down. Sometimes we need to build, because we have this worldview. In order to build something new, we have to deconstruct the old. And in this, this model, this, this prophetic revelation, it's quite the opposite. Show God you have the capability of building something. And once you show God you have the ability of building, then he gives you the authority to, to destroy what was built prior. Are you with me right now? Show them you can do it, and then you have the authority to bring down. And it is a generational component. It, it was the father, and, and it was the father's altar. That, was, that must have been difficult, politically incorrect. I mean, the cultural dynamics of this and the Jewish custom for him to destroy that altar that daddy had constructed. And I, I am believing that people do preach a lot about generational curses. I love to elevate the idea of generational blessings. I really do, because there is a truth. We have the power to bring down the altars that our fathers and our forefathers constructed, these altars of expediency. We, we have the power to do that. Matter of fact, you have to believe that. The idea that if your grandfather was an alcoholic and your daddy was an alcoholic, you are an alcoholic and your child will be an alcoholic. If your great granddaddy was a philanderer and your daddy was a philanderer and somehow it's, a, it's part of your somehow cultural genome and your mitochondria and you're inclined to look the other way and therefore you gotta, you gotta bind that and rebuke that in the name of Jesus. You, you are a thriver. You built shalom. You have the power to take that altar and crush it in the name of Jesus. We're going to flip things around. I am believing and declaring that instead of saying my great grandfather was this, my father was this, he was an alcoholic, a drug addict, a philanderer, therefore I am. We're going to shift that around. I declare in Australia that this generation will say not that my great grandfather was an alcoholic and my daddy was an alcoholic and therefore I'm an alcoholic. I believe there's a generation that will declare I believe that in the name of Jesus you're going to be able to say as a matter of fact our children and our children's children's children will say my grandfather was a man of God my father was a man of God my mother was a woman of God my grandmother was a woman of God I am a man of God and your children and your children's children will be children of God why? because we have the anointing to tear down the altars of expediency. If you believe that for your children and your children's children, raise your hand. If you really believe that, raise your hands really high and repeat after me. Say in Jesus' name, today, this very hour, we destroy, we bring down all the altars of expediency. I declare that my children, my children's children, my children's children's children will be blessed, will be favored, will be saved, will be full of the glory of Jesus Christ, and they will change their world. If you believe that, give God your best shout of praise. change the world we will change the world we will change the world we'll break down the altar of expediency and we will build more shalom's we will stand with me you are stand with me those that are not and, there's, and don't drink the Kool-Aid what does that mean there was a recent report by a global research company that came to this like horrific conclusion. I kid you not. It's a U.S.-based research, but 
they, they looked at it global Christianity trends and they came to this Kool-Aid conclusion that this that anybody here between the ages of 15 and 30 raise your hand anybody want to be between the ages of 15 and 30 raise your hand they came to the conclusion that that generation would be the last viable global generation advancing Christendom that it will be the last and after that that by the end of this century Christianity will not survive in any viable or sustainable manner they have declared I kid you not that this is the last chapter of Christendom that's what the Midianite marauders believed uh -uh. matter of fact I know it's quite the opposite I, there's a reason why hell hates this generation there, there's a reason why all of hell has stood up to silence and kill this generation do you understand why I believe this generation is about to see God's glory like generation will bring down the altar of expediency this generation will build shalom this generation will change the world I'm done you bring it down did you bring down the altars of expediency did you bring down that generationally specific driven motif of surrendering truth of all the curses did you bring it down yes sir I have shalom the only altar standing is the shalom but I love this there was this poll called the Azura poll you have to read this the Azura poll and I'm not gonna get into the Canaanites and, and the goddess and what it represents we don't have the time I can tell you this, I love what the Lord tells them. Uh, hey, Gideon, you see that poll? That poll was the reminder. It was the visible reminder of the Midianites, of the paganistic false captivity, enslavement of God's children. Whenever they would walk around and see the poll, it was a reminder that we are subject, we are subjugated. So it was a physical reminder of the devil's construct. It was what the enemy constructed to intimidate, to manipulate, to prompt them to hide in the, in the proverbial threshing floor. But the Lord comes around and says, hmm, your build is, huh? You see that thing that's there, the Azra pole? Read it, amazing. The Lord says, I love this. The Lord says, cut it down. And it sounds like obvious, right? Yeah, we're gonna cut it down. Well, cut down what the devil can suck, cut down. But that's not what it says. Read it. Because you would think normally, I'm going to cut that down. I'm going to find the largest garbage bin. And I'm going to just do away with everything the Midianites constructed. And even before the Midianites, the Canaanites, they were, we're going to take away with the goddess Ur. And the, the Ur, I'm going to take away that reminder and throw it away. That's not what God says. This is the word God gave me for you. It's exactly what God told Gideon. Cut down the pole and use the wood to fuel your altar. <laughs> You're gonna get that right about tomorrow morning at 7.13 in the morning. Wait, whatever the enemy constructed to intimidate you, to stop you, to hinder you, to obstruct you, you're gonna cut it down, but it's gonna fuel your breakthrough. It's gonna fuel your faith. It's gonna fuel your destiny. Cut it down, but let it fuel. So I prophesy, whatever pull, whatever the enemy has constructed around you, and your family and your dream and your ministry and your integrity and your righteousness and your health and your finances and your future whatever the enemy has built whatever Azra pole is occupying your vision you're gonna cut it down but you're not just gonna cut it down you're actually gonna use it to fuel the greatest season of your life 
Tell your neighbor, cut it down. 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 I am declaring that you are about to occupy the very area that all of hell has fought to keep you out of. And everything the enemy has constructed to intimidate you will actually fuel the greatest season of your life. God is turning it around in your favor. It's going to fuel. What about all the people that hate on me? What about all the people that, that talk about me? What about the circumstance that God, God has the power of using all of that to fuel the greatest season of your life? He really has that power. You need to believe with me this is your season to build an altar of shalom and to fuel everything that God has purposed for your life. You know what that Azure pole is. I mean, you know what it is. Raise both hands right now and just repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, every single construct, everything the enemy has created, has constructed to intimidate, to stop, to hinder, to obstruct my purpose, my destiny. I declare today, this very hour, it's coming down, but I will not discard it. I declare that all of it will serve as fuel for the greatest season of my life. Give God your best shout of praise. We're done. He cut it down and people started talking trash. Smack the haters. I don't know if anybody ever said any haters, but the, the haters, yeah. And they got on Old Testament Twitter. <laughs> and they started to tweet. And they, I kid you not, but it was even his own tribe. That's the sad part. It was his own tribe. His own people. His own peeps in Los Angeles, his home, homie G dogs up OG. <laughs> and he started accusing him. I got, he took his father's altar, knocked it out. How dare he, then he cut down the answerable. Why? The Bible says that inevitably, at the end of the day, I love Gideon's comment, let Baal defend himself. And then the same, the same people that, I, you need to read it, that, that rose up and spoke and, and laid out false allegations, ended up at the end supporting and fighting for Gideon. Here's a radical declaration. Those that have accused you will end up following you and fighting for you. How about that? So rise up, Australia, rise up. Rise up as mighty warriors because you are mighty heroes. Rise up with the strength to overcome. Rise up to defeat the forces of captivity responsible for taking away your harvest. Rise up and build shalom and destroy Baal's altar, your father's altar. Ugh. Cut down the Azurapol, the very things the devil created around you and use it as fuel for your breakthrough. Oh, 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 oh. Rise up, rise up. Rise up and obey like Noah. Rise up and believe like Abraham. Rise up and wrestle like Jacob. Rise up and dream like Joseph. Rise up and advance like Moses. Rise up and conquer like Joshua. Rise up and pray like Hannah. Rise up and worship like David. Rise up and reign like Esther. Rise up and prophesy like Elijah. Rise up and shout like Bartimaeus. Rise up and climb like Zacchaeus. Rise up and preach like Peter. Rise up and shake it off like Paul. Rise up and live like Jesus. Rise up and change the world. And always 
remember, when life throws you rocks, when life throws you rocks, when life throws you rocks, may the strength of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the anointing of God's Holy Spirit make this season the best season of your life. We love you. God bless you. Come on, let's give it up for Reverend Samuel.